Good afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Shop Talk, Imaging the ACHD Patient. My name is Kelly Baer and I'm the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar, as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left sidebar, please note the resources tab. Click on this tab for a link to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the request support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the ASE CEU credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. This webinar is a joint presentation of IAC, ASE, and SOAP. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenter, Bernadette Richards. Ms. Richards is the Technical Director of the Pediatric Echo Laboratory at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. She is certified as a registered diagnostic cardiac sonographer in the areas of adult echo, fetal echo, and pediatric echo, and is a fellow of the ASE. Ms. Richards serves on the board of directors for the Society of Pediatric Echocardiography as a sonographer representative. She serves on the IAC Echocardiography Board of Directors representing SOAP. She is a true expert in the field, and we are happy to have her with us today. And with that said, I will now turn this webinar over to today's speaker, Bernadette Richards. Bernadette? Thanks, Kelly and Bev. Um, just a quick thank you to the IAC and the SOAP and the ASC for allowing me to present today. I do not have any disclosures. Um, we will start with a little bit of background um, and then get, get into the agenda. So over the past few decades, there have been tremendous strides in the diagnosis and treatment of congenital heart disease. Due to these advances, our patients are living longer lives. And today, we have more adults than children living with congenital heart disease. This population is expected to increase by about 5% per year. It is estimated that today, there are more than 2 million adults living with, adult, with congenital heart disease. These patients are being scanned in pediatric echo labs, adult labs, and adult congenital labs. These particular echoes require not only an understanding of the anatomy and physiology of the defect, but also the technical ability to perform the necessary images and provide the proper data to the interpreting physician. In addition to the large number of patients with previously diagnosed congenital heart disease, there's also a population of adults who have undiagnosed congenital heart disease that may present uh, to an echo lab. So just a little uh, intro, oftentimes uh, an adult congenital echo uh, can feel like this, just a bag of miscellaneous puzzle pieces. Um, here's your next patient. Oh, okay, do you have any history? No, nope, sorry. Um, do you have a picture, any additional imaging? Nope, sorry. Do you know if all of the pieces are in there? I don't really know. No problem. Of course, I think we've all been there with an echo without any history and, and you're not even sure what the initial heart defect was. So hopefully today I'll provide you with a few more tools in your tool belt to help you uh, when you encounter these sorts of situations. 
Uh, in this statement paper related to congenital heart disease in the older adult, we read that standards for echo reporting have not been established and that methodical anatomic reporting routinely used in pediatric reports should be adopted for adult congenital reports. The adult congenital echo uh, should be performed with a systematic anatomic and physiological approach. Proper measurements should be performed that will allow for serial quantitative comparisons. And of course, the results should help determine disease progression and the timing of intervention or surgery. So over the next several minutes, I'd like to provide a general framework for sonographers who may be expected to perform an echo on an adult congenital patient. If you are, an, if you are in an institution where you may be expected to perform adult congenital echoes, or you're in an adult lab and occasionally have patients come in with undiagnosed congenital heart disease, you need to plan to be able to perform these echoes with efficiency and proficiency. When I talk about planning, I'm referring to the education related to what is expected from an adult congenital echo. We will also talk about preparing for these echoes or the prep work for your individual patients or specific lesions. Appropriate prep, prep work leads to the development of a good checklist for what you need to image in addition to your standard lab protocol. Throughout this talk, I will refer to this checklist, and I need you to know that I'm referring to what is needed in addition to your standard lab protocol, not in place of your standard protocol. Then we will talk about performing the echo with an emphasis on alternative windows, measurement techniques, and assessment of PA pressures. There are several ways to plan for these echoes. There are some um, textbooks that are specific to congenital echo. Uh, there's a workbook. This particular work, work, workbook or atlas is an inexpensive tool. Um, it's about $40 that has the nomenclature, diagrams, and echo pictures of many uh, CHD lesions. There are guidelines. Um, in these pediatric guidelines published by the ASC, there are beautiful diagrams demonstrating the different views, and we will go over some of those diagrams here in a few slides. There are quantitative guidelines with descriptions and examples of proper measurement techniques. There's also an incredibly thorough paper which goes over imaging expectations for the patient with transposition of the great arteries, both L transposition and D transposition. Of course, there are many journal, journal articles that are applicable to imaging these patients. A little later, we'll go over some of the highlights um, from this paper, which tells us how we can go beyond the peak TR jet to estimate PA pressures. There's enough, another recent paper which details echo recommendations for the adult congenital patient. Then, of course, if you are more of a hands-on learner, please connect with a local adult congenital lab and request uh, to shadow or observe. Many labs have a mechanism in place to allow for this sort of professional development. Then, of course, there are uh, ACHD tracks at many of the scientific sessions and what you're doing right now, taking advantage of CME opportunities related to this topic. If you do not have an easily accessible educational binder or electronic folder in your lab, I would highly suggest that you start one. This is a place where not only your lab-specific protocols can live, but also the ACE guidelines for the performance of a pediatric or congenital echo and any other guidelines or articles that you find helpful. There's no sense starting from scratch every time you have to do a specific type of echo. I love these diagrams from the Pediatric ACE Guidelines, which demonstrate um, a heart model and the sound beam with their corresponding echo images. Um, sweeps are an essential part of congenital imaging. Um, in congenital imaging, we perform a lot of sweeps. Um, think of a sweep as a complete motion from side to side or anterior to posterior or superior to inferior. It shows us what is going on in between just the typical slices um, that we typically obtain. Here, of course, is again another diagram demonstrating parasternal short axis view. We have our typical um, left ventricle here, mitral valve with the diagram, and then that slice at the base. 
This is an example of a 2D sweep. So starting near the apex and sweeping all the way up um, to the base. Uh, and then, of course, we do the same thing in color with color Doppler sweep near the apex, sweeping the reticular septum, a little VSD there in red. This is the example of the um, apical forechamber that we're all familiar with. Um, I superimpose these little compass points here, which um, help us when we have an abnormal patient describe what we see and where we see it. Um, with an apical four-chamber sweep, we often uh, tilt up even further to image um, the RVOT and pulmonary artery. We have our subcostal sweeps, um, which provide our, of course, uh, great interrogation of the atrial septum, but also provide us with the opportunity to look at the LVOT and the RVOT and pulmonary artery. This is an example of a um, 2D sweep and subcostal coronal view. You start off with the atrial septum, LVOT, all the way up to the RVOT and pulmonary artery. And the same sweep performed with color Doppler, showing a PFO there, the color flow Doppler and the SVC, a VSD, all the way up again to the RVOT and pulmonary artery. Now, of course, we cannot always obtain beautiful pictures like these in the adult congenital patient, but sometimes we can uh, use these subcostal views in particular to provide a very good opportunity for Doppler interrogation, uh, especially for patients who may have an RV to PA conduit. The use of conduits between the RV and the PA is a part of many congenital heart repairs. Over time, the conduit may develop stenosis or insufficiency. Here's an example of a subacostal sagittal sweep in 2D starting near the LV apex, sweeping through the RVOT and all the way up until the atrial septum. Again, the same sweep performed with color Doppler starting at the level of the atrial septum all the way down to the LV apex. This is an example of a patient who does have an RV to PA conduit. Here in 2D, you can see we have direct vis visualization and then again with color allowing for um, Doppler. The suprasternal notch views are also important in congenital imaging. This is um, what we sometimes refer to as uh, the suprasternal notch three o'clock view where we can see the left anominate vein, the right SVC, transverse aorta, right pulmonary artery, and the left atrium. This view is important because many of our adult congenital patients have a single ventricle repair, which involves a Glen shunt. So the SVC is disconnected from the right atrium and connected to the RPA. It's important to interrogate Glen shunts. This is an example of a patient with a Glen uh, 2D and color flow Doppler, and you can see an unobstructed Glen shunt leading into the pulmonary artery. Now we've planned, we've read, we've observed, we've practiced sweeps. Now we have a real patient. So it's time to prepare or prep. We need to know what the patient's diagnosis is and what he or she may have had done in terms of interventions. Also, it's important sometimes to see if they've had alternative imaging, such as an MRI or a CT. However, we all know that sometimes our orders are like this, vague. They just say CHD or post-repair, or my favorite, follow-up. Well, in those cases, we need to get more information in, a, in an effort to perform the best study. If you have access, and I know that oftentimes we don't, but if you do have access to the ordering physician or nurse practitioner or PA, go and talk to them to ask them if they have a specific question to be answered by the ECHO, or if they know any more about the patient's history. Of course, we are all familiar with the chart dig, going deep into the electronic medical record to find more information about the patient. Oftentimes, old records are scanned into some random tab that will tell us a lot of the information we are looking for. Sometimes, our patients or their parents are good historians. Even the location of a scar can help us determine what the patient may have had done. For example, a patient that has had surgery but is can't quite remember what they had done, who has a scar on their left side, may have had a coarctation or PDA repair versus an open heart procedure. 
There are multiple ways of preparing a checklist for your specific patient or specific lesion. This is, a, again, the previously mentioned paper um, from the International Society of Adult Congenital Heart Disease. Within this paper, they do have a suggested adult congenital protocol, but they also, at the end of the paper, have some supplementary data, including a link which will get you to 12 disease-specific protocols that are in Microsoft Word pro, uh, format, easy to print out and uh, add to your binder. This is an example of one of their disease-specific um, protocols about the arterial switch operation, which is performed uh, for patients who have detransposition of the great arteries. It has beautiful information, a beautiful diagram, detailed information on uh, summarizing this sort of um, report. In this diagram, we can see that part of this repair is that the PA is pulled from its posterior position anteriorly, and the branch PAs now straddle the aorta. This is important to know from an imaging perspective, because although the physiology is now normal, the imaging of the pulmonary arteries by echo is not performed in the standard views. At the end of this um, disease-specific protocol is a list of postoperative uh, complications. Um, supravalvar pulmonary artery stenosis is sometimes caused by scarring at the anastomosis or origin of the branch pulmonary arteries. And this requires reintervention in anywhere from 5 to 30 percent of patients post-arterial switch. Branch pulmonary artery stenosis is uh, more commonly involves the left pulmonary artery as it stretches over the ascending aorta. Supravalvar aortic stenosis occurs less frequently in about 2% of the patients. Right ventricular outflow tract obstruction can also occur. Progressive dilation of the neoaortic root can occur, which can compress the branch pulmonary arteries. Various degrees of aortic valve regurgitation occurs in up to half of the patients. And LV systolic dysfunction is often seen in patients who have had coronary artery anomalies. Utilizing this list, we really have our checklist for these um, types of echoes or types of patients. Uh, this is an echo performed on a 24-year-old patient who is status post-arterial switch. You can see here in his long axis view um, the VSD patch as well as some dilation of his aortic root. Then aortic regurgitation. Then we move on to the parasternal short, short axis view. And the first thing you'll probably notice is, yes, this patient does have a bicuspid aortic valve. But also, what we're not seeing is our typical pulmonary artery and branch pulmonary arteries over here. And again, that's because they're not in that location. They're in a different location, which requires alternative imaging views. So this is a parasternal short axis um, demonstrating the neopulmonary valve here, right above the aortic valve. Play that one more time. And then moving uh, over into a different window, we can image the right pulmonary artery as it's, it's straddling uh, the aorta. Again, with some image adjustment, we can image the left pulmonary artery as well. Non-traditional views. This is the same patient's um, apical five-chamber view, and you can see the uh, aortic valve there and the LV. But we also see the pulmonary valve here, neopulmonary valve, and the pulmonary artery. Again, same picture with color flow Doppler. At the beginning, here's the LVOT, and then just right next door, here's the RVOT and pulmonary artery. Same patient, supersternal view. You can see the arch looks a little bit different from our, our typical patient. But also with color flow Doppler, this is a good opportunity to interrogate that supravalvar area or even the aortic valve. One of our newer sonographers developed a checklist of sorts in a tip sheet format. This is something that we, will, we all probably do in our head every day for specific lesions, but we haven't taken the time to put onto paper. 
Utilizing this format, we are expanding our learning library, binder, electronic folder to include tip sheets for a variety of lesions. This tip sheet can be, perform can be formatted in any way so you can do it yourself or as a group. This is just an example of our tip sheet for ASDs. Again, it has a little illustration with four types of ASDs, descriptions, some red flags in a patient who might present to your lab with an undiagnosed ASD, the different types, important anatomy to image, imaging tips or extra views, important questions to answer, and post-op uh, imaging tips. Again, this can be formatted in any way that will uh, help you to prepare for these types of echoes. This is again one of the ACHD protocols in the adult congenital paper. Uh, this one is related to the Rostelli procedure. Uh, Rostelli operations are performed in a variety of congenital abnormalities with a common theme being the presence of a VSD and RVOT um, obstruction. Uh, some patients who have a double outlet right ventricle with a VSD get this repair or some transposition patients or truncus patients. Um, this procedure uh, uses a patch to deviate blood from the left ventricle across the native VSD to the aorta. The native pulmonary artery is, is disconnected proximally and a valved uh, RV to PA conduit is inserted. Uh, the conduit is typically um, quite anterior in close proximity to the sternum, which often necessitates those alternative or non-standard imaging planes to interrogate the area. Some of the post-operative um, complications can include LVOT obstruction, RV to PA conduit dysfunction, uh, residual VSD, aortic root dilation, or biventricular dysfunction. Again, this helps us develop our checklist for these sorts of patients. Changing gears a bit, um, I'd like to stop and talk about the aorta and our role in the echo lab as it relates to the interrogation of the aorta. We all know bicuspid aortic valve is, occurs in 1% to 2% of the general uh, population. Um, bicuspid aortic valve, aortic wall changes, and systemic hypertension may together be responsible for aneurysmal formation of the ascending aorta. Aneurysms of the ascending aorta or in the region of the aortic isthmus are the most dangerous complications because they carry the risk of life-threatening rupture. When talking about bicuspid aortic valves in relation to congenital heart disease, it is important to also talk about coarctation, as more than a third of patients with a coarctation also have a bicuspid aortic valve. While most of these patients present as infants, it is still possible for them to present as adults. In the echo lab, we see a variety of aortopathies with dilation in one or more sections of the aorta. Aortopathies, of course, are concerning to the potential of rupture or dissection. Dilation may occur in the aortic root, the tubular ascending aorta, the proximal aortic arch, or any contiguous combination of these three. Supracoronary or ascending aortic aneurysms often occur in patients with bicuspid aortic valve or coarctation. Then we have more of the uh, genetic syndromes like Lois Dietz, Marfans, or Ellos Danlos, who have more of the aortic root dilation or aneurysm. And many of our conal truncal patients, uh, such as Tetralogy of Fallot, Truncus arteriosus, or pulmonary atresia, can develop a tubular type dilation of the aorta. Of course, there are also post-operative patients that have dilated aortas simply due to their repair, such as a Ross procedure, patients who have a single ventricle, or some of our arterial switch procedures. This is an example. Um, this is an echo performed on a 15-year-old patient who had a primary coarctation of the aorta repair. She also has a bicuspid aortic valve. Her valve is non-stenotic and non-regurgitant, and her coarctation repair is um, great. But she's being followed now because she has this ascending aorta dilation. So it's important to, uh, even though everything physiologically is functioning well, it's important to um, assess the aorta specifically in these sorts of patients. In this chart, we can see that patients who have a coarctation and a bicuspid aortic valve are at a higher risk for aortic wall complications. The pink bars represent patients who had a coarctation repair but have a normal trileaflet aortic valve. 
The blue bars represent patients who have had a coarctation and also have a bicuspid aortic valve. You will notice that aortic wall complications occur much more frequently in the group that have both a bicuspid aortic valve and a coarctation. Okay, so I bet you're saying, I get the point, aortas dilate, what does this mean for me? Um, according to the ACE recommendations, the proximal aorta should be measured at the following levels in a parasternal long axis view at the moment of maximal expansion. The aortic root at the sinuses of Valsalva, the ST junction, and the ascending aorta as it crosses in front of the RPA. Optimal imaging of the entire proximal aorta is not always available in the standard parasternal window, and a high left parasternal located one or two rib spaces superior to the standard location may be required. Occasionally, a high right parasternal with the patient lying on their right side allows us to obtain this image. Here we can see demonstrated the movement often needed going from a traditional parasternal long axis view to a high left parasternal view in an, in an effort to obtain the proper, me proper measurement of the ascending aorta. Many of our patients have aortic, aortic or neo-aortic stenosis, frequent, frequently utilizing a high right parasternal or modified suprasternal view can yield a more accurate Doppler assessment of the valve when compared to the traditional apical four-chamber Doppler. In this patient, we obtained a peak Doppler velocity of 3.7 meters per second from the right parasternal view. In the same patient, the apical four-chamber peak velocity was 2.6. Another important aspect of imaging the aorta is the assessment of the abdominal aorta. Proper Doppler assessment of the abdominal aorta can provide clues towards the diagnosis of severe aortic regurgitation, coarctation of the aorta, or even a hemodynamically significant PDA. There are a couple of simple tricks to allow for the most diagnostic Doppler signal. Notice in this first picture that the sonographer is holding the probe straight up and down with most of her hand in between the probe and the abdomen. While this does allow for imaging of the aorta, the Doppler signal is suboptimal. After adjusting her hand above the probe, allowing the probe to lie closer to the patient's abdomen, we can get a better angle of interrogation on the aorta with a much more helpful Doppler signal. So for our checklist for our patients who have a coarctation and or bicuspid aortic valve, of course it's important to interrogate the surgical site, the descending aorta, but also to take a look at the entire aorta, the aortic valve with proper measurements and Doppler. Now we have a little case study um, related to the aorta. We had a patient um, who had a healthy childhood in the 80s and 90s. 2001, she uh, had her first child. Uh, there was a murmur noted during pregnancy and she did have hypertension during delivery, but did not have any sort of cardiology consultation. 10 years later, uh, she presented to the ER with chest pain, dyspnea, and syncope. At this point, she did have an echo. Uh, here are some of the highlights. Parasternal long axis view with a little bit of LVH. Parasternal short axis view demonstrating a bicuspid aortic valve, which did not have stenosis or regurgitation. Her abdominal aorta was interrogated by color Doppler. The uh, suprasternal notch imaging, uh, imaging her aorta and descending aorta, color Doppler, color Doppler here, noting a little bit of aliasing. Pulse wave uh, Doppler was not helpful. And after adjustment, a continuous wave Doppler demonstrated over five meters per second um, Doppler gradient going down her descending aorta, indicating a pretty significant coarctation of the aorta. So she was told that she had this severe coarctation and she needed to have heart surgery. She did not want to have heart surgery, so she did not come back um, to cardiology. Fast forward six years, she is not feeling well at all, comes back into the ER, 
in a hypertension emergency with a systolic blood pressure above 230. So she has another echo. Again, abdominal aortic interrogation by color flow Doppler only. They knew she had a coarc noted on her previous echo six years earlier, but Doppler interrogation only noted a less than two meter per second Doppler gradient. So after consultation with an adult congenital um, physician, she was then sent for an adult congenital echo. Again, uh, color flow Doppler in her abdominal aorta. Um, this time, spectral Doppler was performed, noting a markedly abnormal pattern. And again, we knew she had this coarctation previously noted, so interrogation of the aortic arch, but with a Doppler velocity of less than two meters per second. This was concerning, so she was then sent to the cath lab. In the cath lab here, you'll see some dye um, into the aorta and the transverse arch. We'll let that play again. You'll see um, the ascending aorta and the transverse aorta fill with dye and delayed filling of the descending aorta here because this patient, in fact, had an interruption of the aortic arch. The descending aorta was now being filled exclusively by collateral vessels. Fortunately, we were able to um, treat this with a covered stent in the cath lab, and uh, this patient had a happy ending with um, a non-surgical repair of a, a pretty critical heart problem. So switching gears again, we're going to talk about RV and PA pressure estimates. Um, this is of particular importance because um, pulmonary hypertension is prevalent sometimes in our adult congenital patients. And also many of our patients have some right heart obstructions. Pulmonary hypertension is a pathological hemodynamic condition defined as an increase in the mean PA pressure of greater than 25 millimeters of mercury at rest. The gold standard diagnostic tool for assessing PA pressures is the right heart cath. ECHO is not the gold standard, but it is a readily available technique accepted as the primary non-invasive tool in the assessment of PA pressure. Many adult congenital patients are at risk for elevated PA pressure, and it is imperative to provide the most accurate estimate as elevated PA pressure is in associated with increased mortality. Over the next few slides, we'll go over some Doppler techniques, their advantages, disadvantages, and some pitfalls in the assessment of PA pressure by echo. So we're all familiar by um, the TR jet peak velocity uh, to estimate PA pressure. Um, a peak TR velocity value of less than 2.8 meters per second is considered normal. But there's some pitfalls. Um, the TR signal could be poor in a good proportion of our patients with lung disease or bad windows. And TR measurement should be avoided in the absence of a good Doppler envelope. Consider trying an off-axis view or foreshortening the ventricles in an effort to get better alignment with the TR jet. Severe TR could cause equalization of right atrial and right ventricular pressures, which may cause the TR envelope to be cut short leading to an underestimate of the PA pressure. Using the peak TR to estimate PA pressure, pressure may be inaccurate in the presence of RV dysfunction. And importantly, calculations using TR trace assume that there is no pulmonary valve stenosis. When your patient has pulmonary stenosis or RVOT obstruction and you're measuring the TR, it's more of an indication of the RV pressure, not the PA pressure. And many of our patients have some sort of pulmonary stenosis, either post-op or pre-op. You can also use the PR jet uh, to estimate a mean pulmonary artery pressure. It's approximated from the peak PR signal using the following formula here. So, for example, this patient who has a, a peak pulmonary regurgitation Vmax of 2.16, would have a mean PA pressure of 24. The PR signal uh, 
isn't always um, the best thing to use. It may be sometimes it's difficult to obtain. Um, in the presence of constrictive or restrictive RV physiology, the PR signal could provide a valuable clue towards a diagnosis, but may be unreliable in the calculation of the PA pressure. So some tips, use multiple jets, multiple views. Um, the paper suggests averaging uh, multiple consecutive uh, measurements. And also agitated saline could improve your Doppler signal. You can also use the PR jet to help calculate the PA diastolic pressure. You can then estimate the mean PA pressure using your TR method for the systolic PA pressure and the PR method for the diastolic pressure. Applying this equation here, two-thirds of the diastolic, PA diastolic pressure plus one-third of the PA systolic pressure gives you an estimate of the mean PA pressure. Um, again, some pitfalls here use, utilizing this method. Um, in severe pulmonary regurgitation, due to the rapid deceleration slope, PRN velocity may underestimate the PA diastolic pressure. And again, it may not be useful um, in patients who have constrictive or restrictive physiology. You can also estimate PA pressure by using a VSD or PDA uh, Doppler peak velocity. You simply subtract the VSD or PDA peak from the systolic blood pressure in order to estimate the PA pressure. You can also estimate mean PA pressure from the RVOT acceleration time. Pulse wave of the RVOT normally produces a dome shape, but in patients with PA hypertension, there is rapid rise to peak, resulting in a shorter acceleration time. In order to estimate this pressure, you place your pulse wave Doppler at end expiration, just proximal to the pulmonary valve. And then to make the measurement, you place your caliper first at the peak velocity, then track back to the onset of flow, as the aim of this measurement is to take the peak velocity, not the propagation. A value of greater than 130 is considered normal, while less than 100 is highly suggested of pulmonary hypertension. So pressure assessment, what should I Doppler? Well, everything, the TR, the pulmonary regurgitation, pulmonary forward flow, and the RVOT. And remember, those subcostal views sometimes uh, offer a better window into the RVOT or pulmonary artery. Of course, also assess the configuration of the ventricular septum. Is it flat? Is it flat in diastole or systole or both? And Obtaining a, systolic, a systemic blood pressure is also important for many of these calculations. So there are many adult congenital patients, and they're receiving echoes in PEDS labs, adult labs, adult congenital labs. Um, if you're expected to image these patients, plan for it by reading, observing, and atten attending educational sessions. I highly suggest creating either a physical or an electronic folder of various things you've learned along the way or disease-specific checklists, guidelines, articles, and as always, use your measuring and Doppler tools as part of your everyday assessment. Remember, the goals of imaging these patients are to provide accurate and reproducible anatomic and hemodynamic information, which allows for the medical and surgical planning and to provide surveillance imaging to evaluate for potential images. With that, I would like to wish everyone a happy Medical Ultrasound Awareness Month. Thank you for your time, and I think that we are going to have a question and answer period. Okay, thank you, Bernadette. And at this time, we will begin the Q&A session. From IAC ECHO, I'd like to introduce Sue Jensen and Ann Groves. They are our clinical specialists. They will be assisting with the Q&A session today. Sue, would you like to start us off? 
Sounds good, Kelly. Thank you, Bernadette. Um, so this first question is going to take you back to the very beginning of your talk. There's some question about whether or not large centers who specialize in congenital heart disease are opening labs for adults. Uh, they said that, she said that her lab is a problem because they don't have enough congenital heart patients to be proficient, and they don't get any, any records then, any surgical records prior to the surgery. So I guess she wants some opinion on that. Yeah, I can see... Um why she's questioning this. Um, It is hard to become proficient in these types of echoes uh, if your volumes are are very low. I don't really have an answer for her. I I think that um, this is a problem facing many institutions, really, and with a a big volume of patients, um, a growing, growing volume of patients. I wish I had the answer, but I don't. Okay, Bernadette, I have a a couple of questions on this topic. Um, When you were showing the measurements for the aortic root, the junctional, and ascending, um, it looked like your measurements were in systole, but a lot of people, I guess, who are in um, the adult lab saying, you know, they were always taught to measure at the end of diastole, so they're a little confused as to which measurements should they be doing, in diastole or in systole? Sure, that's a great question, and I'm, I'm glad um, they wrote it in. Um, it is, we do know that many adult labs make these measurements in diastole, um, and that's fine. Whatever your lab standard is, whether that's measuring the aortic root in diastole or systole, as long as you're consistent. I mean, the goal of measuring this ascending aorta is to see, are there changes over time? Is it getting bigger? The pediatric guidelines state to do it in systole, the adult guidelines say to do it in diastole. Just be consistent within your own lab. And within that, I have a question about whether the aortic roots should be measured from leading edge to leading edge or inner edge to inner edge. I, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe that the current guidelines is inner edge to inner edge. Okay. Well, I'm just going to ask one more question, too. Um, We want to know, where can we find those disease-specific protocols that you discussed in the very beginning? I know you mentioned a paper, but could you be a little more specific? Sure. Um, There is, uh, you'll be able to see the full title of the document. It's um, uh, Echo uh, Echo Protocols, published by the International Society of Adult Congenital Heart Disease. And again, I think this will be on the IAC website as well. Um, but at the very end of the document, there is an appendix with supplemental protocols. And you click on the link, and that's where um, all the Microsoft Word protocols will come up. And it's not everything you'll ever see, but it's helpful for the ones that are there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question on whether or not you guys have a process in place for additional time to perform echoes on adults with congenital disease. I understand why someone asked that question. Um, (laughs) At this point in time, our lab allows for 60 minutes um, for every exam, transthoracic, fetal, adult congenital, um, and that sometimes gets tight for the adult congenital patient. And it's not necessarily the imaging time. It's preparing the preliminary report because, as um, people know, sometimes these patients haven't haven't come back for follow-up in many years or it's their first time here. So building that first preliminary report with all of their uh, history and descriptions of what's going on with their heart now does take a long time. Um, we do have planned next year to do another time study um, to see is it really taking, do we need more than 60 minutes? Do we need 75? I know many labs have 90 minutes for adult congenital. Um, I think that the opportunity to be efficient with these echoes comes in that planning and preparing because I think many sonographers, it's just by our nature, if we don't really know what's going on, we're going to image everything we possibly can over and over again, which can lead to, you know, a long scan time. Makes sense. Um, We have a new set of questions coming in. Um, 
about contrast. She, the first question is, use of agitated saline was mentioned to enhance Doppler signals. So any, should any special considerations be made for patients with shunts, particularly right to left? What about contrast with Definity and Optison? And there's another question along with that, can using a bubble study ever overestimate the pressures? So a couple of questions about, uh, about this. I will admit that contrast is not my specialty. Uh, We do not use a lot of contrast in our lab. Um, I don't think I can accurately answer her question about contrast with shunts. So I'm going to have to look that one up myself after this, uh, after this session. Fair enough. Okay. Well, do uh, the follow up to that is, do you use it at all for your patients with um, congenital heart disease? We partner with um, an adult hospital here, uh, Ohio State University Medical Center, and I think and our adult congenital physicians go back and forth between our institution and OSU, and uh, they have decided within their group that for patients who need contrast imaging, those patients, um, they see those patients over at the adult institution because they are more familiar with the administration of, of contrast agents. So I guess that leads into the next question. Um, Ask: Does your lab collaborate with adult cardiologists on the management intervention in these patients? Absolutely. Um, we have a number of adult congenital cardiologists here who are duly boarded. Um, also within their team are adult cardiologists who did not do a pediatric um, uh, fellowship in the traditional sense, but are. Um, Specialist and they see their adult patients. So we are very lucky that we have um, a number of adult congenital uh, cardiologists here. Okay, um, I have a question on the uh, bicuspid aortic valve and that what, sh- what is the rarest coronary effusion for that? Ooh, that's a toughie. I'd have to look that one up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, didn't mean to stump you. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Um, there is a question here. Our adult congenital patients are by and far large, mo- morbidly obese. Do you have any suggestions how to improve quality image other than using a lower megahertz transducer? We're finding that a lot of our patients are needing cardiac MRIs. That is a fair statement. And uh, we have a very similar problem here in central Ohio. Um, My advice would be to um, go into every scan with an open mind. Uh, Oftentimes we have these very large patients and I I think I'm not going to be able to get anything on this patient, but then they will have one view that I can uh, obtain and I just try to get the most I possibly can out of out of that view. We also communicate, again, like I said, on, on our reports and with the ordering physicians when we can. So, you know, I did the best I possibly could. I tried every, every tool in my tool belt. Um, th- this, is, this is the most I can get out of this echo. And, and oftentimes they hear that message and then they choose uh, to go down uh, al- alternative imaging pathway in the future. Okay, besides a a bicuspid aortic valve, what do you think are the top three adult congenital um, findings that people would present with in a lab? Okay, so I assume they mean undiagnosed. Yes, Um, sorry. I would guess ASDs, a variety of PFO, ASD. Um, Epstein's, I've heard, is, is... uh, sometimes undiagnosed up until adulthood, adulthood, particularly mild forms of Epstein's. Um, and we've actually had a couple patients with L transposition, um, which is basically, you know, ventricular inversion. So physiologically, if there's no VSD and the AV valves are, are normal, these patients can live into adulthood. And, and there's been several reports of them found on autopsy in 60 year olds. So, off the cuff, that those would be my uh, top three that I think could present undiagnosed in an adult lab. 
Okay, so here's an opinion question. Who should read ACHD? Should we send them to a pediatric cardiologist or can we have our adult cardiologist read the study? I feel like I, I feel like this is a trick question, and, and I don't. <laughs> I don't want to get myself in trouble here. Um, it depends on the training. Depends yeah. on the training. You know, some adult cardiologists have had some uh, congenital training and are perfectly fit to interpret um, congenital echoes. So um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, here's another opinion one. Do you find that the PDOF for non-imaging probe is more accurate in determining gradients in the descending aorta post a coarc repair? You know, I think that the machines have come such a long way and are incredible. The Doppler is is the regular continuous wave Doppler is. Uh, really a good tool and I think it's pretty accurate uh, I know 20-ish years ago when I started doing echo I used PDOF a lot more frequently um, but these days I, I seem to get the same the same numbers using PDOF or the regular CW probe okay so here's a question what tips do you have for scanning pulmonary arteries and arterial switch so the tips that I have, I think that you need to come uh, up on the chest a little superiorly, sometimes closer to the sternum, and to do that sweep very slowly, uh, looking for those PAs, like they're riding the saddle is, you know, the name, like the aorta is the mm -hmm. saddle and the, the two PAs ride the saddle. Um, you can use color Doppler to find them initially. Uh, and then um, take your color off to image them in 2D first, of course, and then um, color and spectral Doppler interrogation. But it's, it's more of a superior anterior um, imaging plane versus your traditional uh, interrogation of the PAs. Okay. Which view do you think is best for imaging the Fontaine? So the subcostal sagittal view is really helpful. So um, if you think about your subcostal sagittal, the reference point is at six o'clock on your probe. Um, you would traditionally, this is how you would image the IDC, SBC. Um, and that's basically where your Fontan is, that pathway um, in that same area. Um, I would say that's my favorite view of the Fontan. Sometimes we can't get that, we can't get it. So we'll interrogate um, it from other views or interrogate part of it from other views. There's also a view you can get um, in the supersternal notch um, with your reference point at about 12, kind of angled towards the patient's right a little bit. This is a view that we utilize in some patients to look at the atrial septum or to look um, at that area right where the SVC and the pulmonary vein um, are kind of right near the atrial septum. So in that view, you can also see the Fontan, particularly the superior aspect of the Fontan. Um, so gold standard, that subcostal sagittal view, um, but in addition, uh, you can get bits and pizza, pieces of it um, from subcostal coronal, your suprasternal view. Um, you can see the Fontan in apical view, but it's, that's not really the best view for Doppler interrogation. Unless you're looking for a fenestration, then that's, that's a good deal. Okay. So I have a question sort of off what we were talking about. Um, this questioner wants to know, do your adult congenital physicians perform TEEs? Our ACHD physicians do not, and therefore ask our regular cardiologists to perform, but they don't have a huge, but they're at a huge disadvantage with anatomy. Our ACHD MD isn't always present for these, and he's not able to be there, and then the MD perform them relies heavily on the sonographers. Um, what's your experience with that? Well, we're, we're lucky, like I said, we're a large institution. Um, our adult congenital physicians do not do TEEs here. Um, however, one of our adult congenital physicians also is an echo doc. So we have the best of both worlds. So one or two days a week, we actually have an adult congenital physician staffing the echo lab. Um, and so our, our regular pediatric cardiologists who do the TEEs um, partner with, you know, they have, they have these adult congenital physicians 
very close by to ask questions to. And actually, our in our lab, the sonographers um, don't don't perform TEs at all. Uh, the only thing we do with TEs is clean the probes. <laughs> so our our pediatric cardiologists perform all of the TEs here. Makes sense. Okay, Bernadette, in your opinion, what is the best view to image a mustard sending operation? That's a good question. Um, it depends on the patient. <laughs> That's my official answer. <laughs> um, so I, I used to, mustards used to be my least favorite adult uh, patient to get because they're hard. But um, one day I had this young mustard patient come through and they had the most beautiful pictures and everything just clicked into place. And the first thing I think of now when I think of a mustard is an X because basically you're redirecting the flow coming into the right atrium diagonally over to the left ventricle. And then you're redirecting that pulmonary venous flow from the left atrium over to the right ventricle. So it's really an X. And you need to remember which one of those pathways is anterior, which is the systemic, and which one is posterior, which is the pulmonary flow. If you know, if you understand the physiology and the anatomy of the repair, then when the patient has difficult views or a little bit different from the last patient, then you can image um, you can image a lot better when you really understand what's going on. So parasternal long axis view, you can often see um, the pathway in the left atrium. Uh, the RV inflow view is good. Anywhere you can image the atria or really the crux of the heart, you should be interrogating that pathway. Okay, very good. Can you tell us, are there any normal values for aortic dilatation and conotruncal abnormalities? Okay, so I think think if I'm understanding the question right, they're basically wanting to know if there's Z-scores specific to patients with conotruncal abnormalities. And I think the answer to that question is no. Um, we utilize the Boston Z-scores for aortic root measurements, and they're, they're not disease specific. They just are, you know, based on you know, height, weight, and age, and all the Z-score parameters. Okay, um, I have a couple of questions on f from those people who tuned in a little late, and they want to know, do you have reference books for um, adults with congenital disease that you would recommend? If I was forced to recommend one book that would be the most helpful, it's that atlas. Um, I'm going to grab it right here off my desk. It's called the Atlas of Congenital Heart Disease. It's really a nomenclature book because there's a, a couple different schools of thought on, on what you call things. That's just semantics. But I love the Atlas because it was very inexpensive and it has very good illustrations that just click. You know, many people that are new to the adult congenital echo lab really struggle. Um, and if you say read a 200-page te textbook that's all words, it's going to take a, a lot, lot longer to understand versus these um, illustrations. Um, there are echo, there's, uh, thankfully, there's a couple recent echo textbooks out there, um, a Ben Item published book and then a lie book. But this, they're expensive, of course, and hopefully your lab um, will uh, purchase those for you. But this atlas is, is pretty helpful. And like I said earlier in the talk, if, if it's possible for you to partner up with a local lab that performs a lot of adult congenital echoes and observe or shadow, um, I think that will yield a lot. I think that's a really good opportunity if, if you can um, get into an adult lab. Something I've always wondered when I was in school and someone asked it, why do we invert pediatric images? The hoity-toity explanation is from a pediatric lab. Um, it's anatomically correct. So um, we invert it because the atria really are superior to the ventricles. So we, we sort of like to look at it in that way. Okay. Always wondered. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone, and a very special thank you to Bernadette Richards for her presentation today. Please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session.
To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Shop Talk, Imaging the ACHD Patient. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event. On the left, select the Evaluation tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through the CE Transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.